Okay, in my own time, I managed to clap another video game, which means that I can officially do another vlog review again. This time it's for a game known as Wild Arms. Released in Japan 96 and America 97 from Media Vision, whatever the publishing name was. It's pretty damn good like now again I got this with Breath of Fire 4 and Wild Arms 2 in a flash sale back in March where everything was for one dollar I thought you know this is a pretty good deal Wild Arms series was a series I always wanted to get into since I was at least nine years old. See, the first time I got my hands on something Wild Arms like, it was with like a jam packed demo that I touched in my cousin's house that had a demo for Wild Arms 3. And it was a pretty good demo, it had a bunch of branching paths, it was short. You got to see all the game mechanics in short. And I thought, yo, this is dumb good. So I actually traded a Dragon Ball Budokai game for a jam-packed demo just because of Wild Arms 3. Earlier this year, I saw I finished up White Mage Serenia's Let's Play of Wild Arms, which I've been, which I started watching five years prior, but. Let's not even get into that. Finally being able to get my hands on this was pretty interesting because while I did always want to get my hands on this, it would never be a high priority thing. It's never like I would have gotten this inevitably. This flash sale that happened many months ago really influenced my decision to play this game. And I'm glad it did because it kicks ass. Now, I guess this is my time to review everything step by step, so I guess I gotta start with the graphics. The graphics is easily the worst thing about this game. Except for the anime opening cutscene. The anime opening cutscene that you get every time you boot this game up is pretty damn good. Even my younger brother liked it. He saw the in game engine sprites and he laughed. He saw the in battle polygons and he laughed. And for battles, it's 3D for. End game stuff, the adventure based stuff, it's 2D. But actually, even though the sprites are of low quality, especially relative to its time as well, I do like how the sprites and the polygons for the adventure segments and the battle segments are compatible. It's not like Final Fantasy 7, when it went to battle and when it went out of battle for the adventure parts, those were both polygons, but even so, they just didn't match up. Here it's like, or right, one's 2D, one's 3D, but you get the same vibe. It feels like it belongs together. So while visually, it's ugly, at least it all works together in some form of harmony, which I like. The interface is also pretty good, it's pretty intuitive. A lot of symbols are used, but you hit the triangle button and it extrapolates from what the symbols mean. If you've seen Wild Arms or 
Breath of Fire is one and three and Lufia, you would know what this interface is for battles and out of battle like my menu system works with icons as opposed to seeing whatever section is in a written fashion. I really like all of that visually, I think it all works very well together. As for music, the music is the heart and soul of Wild Arms. Not to say that it has the greatest soundtrack of all time, but that it's infectiously catchy, and it matches with the setting of the game too. They have a one-to-one -one ratio, because the Wild Arms series, for the most part, no, there's four and Alter Code F. It has a Wild West aesthetic. The whole planet is the freaking Wild West. Phil Gaia is a place with cowboys and Indians. So it's pretty interesting as a setting. I really don't get it, but then again, there's RPG settings where the whole freaking planet is a medieval area, medieval Europe, which that's not too realistic either. You gotta have like some Arab spots, you gotta have some Eastern spots, Northeast Asian spots, just, if you're gonna have the whole world, then spice it up so here I don't, I don't think it's too weird that everything's the wild west in fact it kind of gives it an interesting fantasy vibe low fantasy and shit i think it's a setting that should be explored a little more of rpgs or at least a philosophy that you can apply more often because it's a really interesting setting and the music really touches on it now when I beat the game I thought you know, they should have put like a song for the American version instead they had like some instrumentation that I think in a Japanese version must have been a song and I know they did this stuff with Wild Arms 2 where there were songs there but they didn't put it here, instead they just replaced it with instrumentation because no one expects Americans to want to hear Japanese women sing. The battle theme, everything, the world map, the dungeons, it's all good. It's too bad that all the dungeons have the same theme. The first thing we hear in Jack's stage and Jack's scenario, it's pretty damn good, but afterwards it's a little too much. Battle theme wise, there's a battle theme, there's like two boss themes, depending if you're going against like a regular dude or a quarter knight. And then there's a theme if some some guys have their own like special theme like Gazette does. And some specific battles have their own theme. So they at least they add some variety for that department. The dungeons, however, and the world map. The world map has the same theme from beginning to end. In fact the world map pretty much looks very similar. I would say gameplay wise Battles are pretty good and they're pretty inter intuitive, especially with the interface. Like, your three characters all have their own role. Rudy starts off as a really slow tank type of character, but overall he becomes good for consistent DPS when you start getting really good guns and you start upgrading them. And you start getting decent abilities with the guns. Jack is a fast DPS kind of guy and over time when you get flashier moves with him 
and you can buff his strength up, he really, like, can wipe a battle out on his own, pretty much. And Cecilia, she's the magic user from beginning to end. She's slightly slower than Jack, or sometimes just slightly faster than Rudy. And in this case, she's more than just a healer. She's the buff person, the debuff person, and when all of that's said and done, she can do some decent offensive magic as well, which all works with like a crest system. Everyone has their own way of getting more abilities. With Rudy, you learn it through fast draw hands. Cecilia, you find crests, and then you go to magic places to like turn the crest into items, into magic spells of your choice. And you can freely name them, which is fun. Rudy, you just find guns in dungeons that only he can open because they're special chests. And then you go to a town with a gun expert and you customize it for improved accuracy, strength, and bullet capacity. These aren't Hollywood guns, they have limited bullets. So most of the time we will be using a sword with him. And then there's also, aside from all of that, I think it's a uh, Fury points or the phase levels, force levels. In battle, the more you get hit or the more things interesting such happen, the higher your force gauge goes. And with that, you get some special abilities with your characters. Each one has their own. And there's four levels of them that get unlocked as the story progresses and as you get finish certain side quests and it really does add variety to the battles because unlocking those moves really makes it so that over time when the tension rises you can use those desperation attacks and get yourself out of pinches or it could just be an ingrained part of your strategy that you can use to uh, occasionally hit someone with a really cool move like force shot or double attack or double magic towards the end. In the beginning you will use it a little differently. You will use it a lot more frequently with either mystic, accelerator, or force, not force shot. I think it was like some force lock ability. See. No arm lock on. So it starts off as something consistent as opposed to a desperation thing. But it's a pretty decent system. It's like limit break system, but with its own ingrained hierarchy. And I thought it was really good. Out of battle, I do notice that. This game really prides itself on its puzzle solving. And the puzzle solving is really good. Like, think about it like Golden Sun. Except, instead of genies, y'all got yourself, like, four tools that you get over time and use those tools in and out of battle. You dash and dart around these engines. Just going place to place. And the running feature in Wild Arms is pretty unique and it really takes advantage of the 32-bit technology. And in general the dungeons and towns are pretty fun because solving puzzles in them is pretty damn good. This is one of those series where the puzzle solving elements might be good if not better than the actual battle system which a lot of people sing Golden Sun's praises for it, but this is where that really shines, IMO, because I haven't really played Golden Sun. To me, this is this is what what's up, especially since 
you don't really have to worry about genies. It's just tools that your characters already have. It doesn't really expend any features. And it's a lot less time consuming to use. Just switch the characters out. And then switch their tools out. But really, what you do in the story the most and the story itself, that's where I think this game is at its best and at its worst. Because this game took me two months to beat. Two months because I was doing it one hour at a time every other day. Now it is a 34 hour campaign, the way I went through it, but my issue is that it was really repetitive. Here's what you do for the most part in Wild Arms. You go to a town, you talk to a main character type person in a town or a relevant minor character. You learn that there's a problem with that town. So you go to a dungeon, you nab all the treasure there, solve all the puzzles, and fight a boss there to get some kind of MacGuffin or fetch quest item. You go back to the town, you solve the problem, and you get an item that helps you go to the next town and do the same process all over again. This is a big reason as to why a lot of people don't really finish Wild Arms. It's pretty repetitive. And for the 4th or 5th arc, when you go through some of the supposed final bosses, you will think, wow, this is actually kind of getting old. But around the 6th inning, it does start to become a bit easier on you. Things get really good when you get the airship around the 7th arc. Because, well, it's not an airship, it's actually like a flying aircraft. Because that really simplifies the experience. Like, up until now, I'm like, yo, this is way too much of the same stuff. It was really great at first, the first two arcs. And it tried to hang in there. But it needed the variety of the final third of the game, and the final inning. That's what gave it the spice that it needed for me to muscle through it. Especially the side quests and the optional bosses. This game does have some interesting super bosses. But none of them are on the same level as a Final Fantasy super boss. Which doesn't even come close to a Shin Megami Tensei super boss. So the challenges are there, and they are fun, but they're mostly there to give you the full experience of a JRPG. And for that, it does a pretty good job. Like, side quests-wise, this game does a great job. Especially when it comes to breaking up the monotony of having to do the same thing over and over again. The story for this game... It's pretty interesting because it has a couple of fake out endings, especially the first four hours you, when you get the opening credits. Pretty much, the world of Phil Gaia is just like in the world of Final Fantasy 1, it's rotting, it's the king because of a bunch of demons, and you pretty much summon to get her as a force by a bunch of guardians and you gotta save the world. And I think that's it's pretty cool how each of the individual characters have their own struggles and they have really decent interplay. You can tell these characters are genuinely fond of each other as friends and that their friendship when they meet each other one of the first two hours of the game really hits off and really becomes a focal point of the series. I think they did characters pretty well in, in this, like some of the minor characters like Calamity Jane and Emma, 
Professor Emma, some of the bad guys like Zed. It's all pretty good. Now, I don't know about the remake, though, because the remake supposedly adds a bunch of anime tropes to this, which weren't really necessary. I don't like when they add ultra fanservice anime cliches to an otherwise good series. Like, when I beat this game, I thought, man, this is a great series to introduce to someone. Because, just like a youngin. Because it's not ultra fan service ADHD anime. It pretty much reminds me of the anime I was watching when I was a kid. And how it was like every episode, you got this really fun experience that you can go look back and say, yo, I wanted to play something like that again. Storyline was good, characters are good. I'm not saying it's pure innocent fun, I'm just saying there was something you can attach good memories to. Fogai in general is a like very dark, very treacherous place, but it's also a place with a lot of heart, so I could want to be in Fogaya. Whereas after playing Final Fantasy X and X 2 HD, I just think, yeah, that's pretty good. I like what they were going, but I would never want to be part of Spira. Especially with those douchey ass cactuars and those annoying ass talonberries, and everyone is dressed like a doofus. No, I take that hex away from me. I don't want to be in freaking Spira. Anyway, this is your boy Mr. Wonka7, back again with another vlog review. If it was great <sighs> to do this again. Thanks again for watching, and I'll say I make day, everybody.